This is Kristen Anderson, Client Services Manager at Microwave Journal, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar in the Technical Education Webinar Series. Today's topic is Critical Aspects of Dielectric Constant Properties for High Frequency Circuit Design, presented by John Coonrod, Technical Marketing Manager from Rogers Corporation, the Advanced Connectivity Solutions. The webinar will last about an hour, with the first 45 or 50 minutes for the presentation. The rest of the hour will be answering your questions. You may submit a question at any time during the presentation. Just use the Q&A box on the WebEx website. Please address your question to all panelists, which is the default setting. The webinar is being recorded and will be available to replay in the events section of the Microwave Journal website, and it usually takes about 24 hours for it to be posted. About this webinar, having a good understanding of dielectric constant is critical for high-frequency PCB design. This topic is deceivingly simple for those less familiar with the intricacies and the multiple dependencies which dominate design DK. The term design DK is related to the dielectric constant value of the circuit material and should be used for high frequency circuit design and modeling. The design DK of high frequency circuit material is frequency dependent, thickness dependent, and copper surface roughness dependent. These dependencies do interact with each other and, to make matters more complicated, anisotropy may or may not play a significant role in the design variables for a particular application. This webinar will address all issues associated with design DK, give examples with measured data, discuss the test method used to determine design DK, and give direction as to where to find the design DK data for Rogers Corporation's high-frequency circuit materials. About the presenter, John Coonrod is a technical marketing manager for Rogers Corporation Advanced Connectivity Solutions. John has been involved with the printed circuit board industry for over 28 years. The initial 11 years was spent in the flexible printed circuit board industry responsible for circuit design, applications, processing, and materials engineering. Following this experience, John supported the high-frequency, rigid printed circuit board materials made by Rogers in regards to circuit fabrication, application support, and electrical characterization studies of these materials. John is the Vice Chair on the IPC D2, D24C High Frequency Task Group and holds a degree from Arizona State University in Bachelor of Science Electrical Engineering. So John, I'll let you take the presentation from here. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for your attendance. So today we're going to be talking about critical aspects of dielectric constant properties for high frequency, and uh, specifically the circuit design and modeling is really what the emphasis is going to be on. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and get started. The first slide is just really an overview of what I plan on going through. And uh, you can see we're going to do a, a fair amount of topics today. Uh, I'm hoping to hit about 45 minutes or 50 minutes of talking, maybe a little less, but to also leave some time for questions. Um, and also, I did a webinar late September on, the, on a subject of 110 gigahertz testing and characterization, characterization up to that. And uh, some of these topics is going to be uh, actually very similar to that. So if you've seen that webinar, some of this is going to be a repeat. But also, uh, being that some of this is a little abstract, maybe it's good to see that twice. Uh, so anyway, first off, I'm going to talk about frequency dependency for dielectric constant and isotropy, and then talk about copper surface roughness and how that affects loss and um, phase velocity and other things. And then uh, some dependencies that we're worried about, like substrate thickness dependency, and then uh, talk also about design decay, which is a term that we've kind of coined some time ago that I'll explain in more detail and why that's important and then give some examples and some details. And then finally, I'll tell you where you can find this design DK information for any of the Rogers materials. So with that, let's get started with some frequency dependency concerns. Uh, so as I go through this, it's going to be kind of a simplified overview of actually a more complicated topic, but I really don't have the time to get into details. Uh, so I'm really just going to hit the basics, enough to get the point across, hopefully. Uh, so anyone that's uh, RF engineer that's dealt with electromagnetics uh, any amount of time, you've probably seen that first formula. It's a pretty basic formula of uh, electric uh, displacement vector field uh, is equal to the electric field intensity and the complex permittivity uh, multiplied together. And uh, what I want to do is take that formula and rearrange it in the sense of materials and how materials uh, are related to that formula. And the first thing to think about would be when electric field is applied to a dielectric material, uh, dipole moments, electric dipole moments are induced and set up in the material, and this is on a molecular level. 
And as these, uh, as the electric field is turned on and turned off, these dipole moments set up and relax, set up and relax. As you go faster and faster, uh, the relaxation actually happens less, and that actually causes something we're going to talk about a little bit later that is uh, material decay uh, dispersion. Um, anyway, these dipole moments are really important to understand, and uh, they augment the displacement flux. So these dipole moments really do have an effect on how the material would perceive the dielectric constant with an applied electric field. And in a material sense, there is a polarization vector P that is related to <coughs> the material itself. So just rearranging that equation above to have P in there, and I'll define P in just a little bit. Uh, and then also I have epsilon naught there defined in the formula, and that's just the permittivity of free space. So uh, next is just the same formula and getting into a little more detail. And one point that I'd like to make is that most of the dielectrics, or actually all the dielectrics I know of in the high-frequency printed circuit board industry are considered linear dielectrics, which means the uh, polarization vector P is actually has a linear response to the applied uh, electric intensity, the E field. And that formula is uh, described here for the polarization vector. The uh, chi, that is actually electric susceptibility of the material. And that is kind of, as the name implies, how susceptible the material is to the electric field in regards to how these dipole moments set up and relax. Also, what happens with these dipole moments, moments as they are displaced or rotated even. So the electric susceptibility is a uh, material property. So then rearranging this equation again to really get it to be defined in sense of material properties, uh, that's the top equation. So you can see that the uh, displacement vector field D uh, is equal to, move over uh, two equal signs, the uh, free space epsilon naught times one plus chi times the uh, electric field intensity. So that's really how you define the electric properties in a sense of, uh, of the material, how it relates to the, the electric field flux. And then for the complex primitivity, which is this epsilon, that's equal to uh, epsilon prime minus J epsilon double prime, and epsilon prime is the real component. It's also associated with the storage component of the dielectric. And epsilon double prime is the imaginary component, and that's actually associated with the dissipative component. And as a general statement, uh, epsilon prime is more associated with dielectric constant, epsilon double prime associated with dissipation factor tangent delta. And formulas are given there below where uh, dielectric constant DK, I'll call dielectric constant DK throughout this presentation. It may not be the best term for it because it's really relative permittivity, uh, but that's just the habit I've got into and I think it's pretty common in the industry. So DK is equal to the real component, epsilon prime divided by the free space, and then you can see tan delta, a dissipation factor, is the ratio between the imaginary and the real component of complex permittivity. So moving on a little bit more with these dipole moments, and um, what we find is the dipole moment displacement, as these dipole moments are set up and relaxed, the displacement itself of the dipole moments um, actually contribute to the dielectric constant, the DK itself, or epsilon sub r. The molecular friction uh, due to these dipole moments uh, uh, rotating, that's actually what's contributing to the tan delta or the dissipation factor. Uh, depending on the material properties, though, uh, you can have uh, these dipole moments set up, relax, and rotate differently. And generally speaking, at low frequencies, there's not too much interaction. But at higher frequencies, uh, around 10 megahertz to 300 gigahertz, most of the interaction between the electric field and these dipole moments is uh, really occurring within this frequency range. And it is very dependent on the type of substrate, and uh, in some cases, it's definitely below that 10 megahertz range. That's just an approximate ballpark type of range. Um, so dispersion. Dispersion is a term that I'm sure most RF engineers are very familiar with. Typically, dispersion is in the sense of transmission lines, where someone may think of as a microstrip transmission line is much more dispersive than a strip line. And that's all true, uh, but in this case, we're talking about dispersion in the sense of material and specifically dielectric constant. So dispersion is how much the dielectric constant actually changes with a change in frequency. And all materials have dispersion. Uh, some materials have more dispersion than others, uh, but it is something really important to understand, especially wideband applications and there's other issues as well. But these uh, dipole moment relaxations, um, that actually contributes a lot to the dispersion. And I'll explain that a little bit more in just uh, the next slide. 
but essentially at very low frequencies, uh, maybe a kilohertz or a few kilohertz a change in frequency really doesn't change the dielectric constant, or the dielectric constant really doesn't change with the change in frequency. As you get higher and higher frequencies, what happens is these moments set up and relax, set up and relax, and you go faster and faster. They don't fully relax. And when that happens, uh, it augments the um, dielectric constant of the, um, of, the, of the material itself. So actually you get a different response once you get in the range where these dipole moment relaxations are not fully relaxed, basically, and they're adding more energy to the, to the material. And that's usually in a microwave range of frequencies. And uh, here's a chart that I took out of a textbook, actually. And this is a pretty common chart that I think a lot of us have seen in the industry. And it's really describing uh, the frequency and the dielectric constant behavior of a generic dielectric material. And what it's showing is that very low frequencies, the epsilon prime, which is related to dielectric constant, is really truly a constant. So at that point, the term dielectric constant is probably correct. It is a constant. But once you get up in the low microwave range of frequencies and beyond that, now dielectric constant with the change in frequency is really not a constant. It's actually changing. So the dielectric constant actually is changing with frequency and the microwave range of frequencies that we normally look at. And it can start around 10 megahertz, and it actually can even start lower than that, I think. But you do get this somewhat nonlinear response at the lower frequencies, of, lower frequencies and up to about... Um, I'd say 5 to 8 gigahertz, and it depends on the material. And then after that, from about 8 gigahertz on out to, geez, about 250 or 300 gigahertz, you get a pretty linear response with that actually constant versus frequency, but it does have a slight negative slope. Now, this curve is a generic, uh, uh, for a generic dielectric material, so it shows visually a pretty significant negative slope. Uh, even though there's no y-axis, but actually for low-loss materials used in the high-frequency printed circuit board industry, as you'll see, the slope is definitely a negative slope, but it's a very gentle slope, so there's not that much difference for the good high-frequency circuit materials for dielectric constant versus frequency over a wide range of frequencies. So just to prove the point a little bit, I did some testing on the same sheet of material. So this is one copper clad lamina, and I tested it three different ways. And I use test methods that uh, are able to test the material at different frequencies. And I was looking for that same trend. And the trend being higher frequency means lower dielectric constant. So the first test I did was FSR. FSR stands for full sheet resonance. And it's really taking the copper clad laminate and testing it as a resonator. So the copper clad laminate is essentially acting like an open walled parallel plate waveguide. And you establish a standing wave. And from that resonant peak of the standing wave and other things, you can determine the dielectric constant. So the lower node or the dominant node, actually, FSR node 1, 0, is uh, lower frequency. I think it's about 180 megahertz or so. And then the node 2, 0 is a little higher frequency. And sure enough, I did see the trend that as I go from low frequency to higher frequency, I get a decrease in dielectric constant. And that's on the raw copper laminate itself. Then I sent that laminate out, had circuits made brought it back, and then I evaluated some circuits, and on, on the circuits, a part of them was a 1 gigahertz ring resonator and a 5 gigahertz ring resonator. The 1 gigahertz ring resonator uh, at lower frequency had a dielectric constant about, uh, what is that, 3.57 roughly, I'm guessing, and then the 5 gigahertz ring resonator is about 3.55, so again, when you go higher frequency, dielectric constant decreases. And then I use the microstrip transmission lines, and that's the curve that I generated here that's a blue curve. And that shows, again, that as you go higher frequency, dielectric constant decreases. So as, uh, as this shows, really, and as the uh, previous slide shows, that for dipole moment relaxation and due to that, as you go higher frequency, the dielectric constant should decrease and does. So let's see, anisotropy. So this is a topic that uh, sometimes surprises people that are not that familiar with materials, but it can be important for certain type of uh, microwave or RF designs. And really what uh, anisotropy is in regards to dielectric constant and materials anyway, um, anisotropy is basically saying that the material is not isotropic, which means uh, the dielectric constant is not the same on all three axes. And this is actually pretty common in the printed circuit board industry and the high-frequency printed circuit board industry, where the z-axis, which is the thickness, that dielectric constant is many times different than the x or the y-axis of the material. So that means anisotropy, that the dielectric constants are not the same on the three axis of the material. 
So the anisotropy is really due to non-uniform electric susceptibility of the material, or the electric susceptibility of the material is not the same on all three axes. And that can actually be due to several different things. Uh, one of them that's probably a little bit more common is um, the woven glass reinforced materials. And uh, Rogers does offer materials that is non-woven glass, so we do not have glass in it. And then we also have high-frequency materials that does have woven glass. So the woven glass layers are going to cause the material to have a different dielectric constant in the XY plane than it will in the Z axis or thickness axis. And that's pretty common, actually, for a lot of materials in the industry. And then the materials that have filler, and there's a lot of different types of fillers that could be used, but in general, if it's a non-spherical filler, what happens is these fillers will actually orient in a, uh, a dominant direction during the lamination process as we make the laminate. So as the laminate is in a gel state being laminated and going through a curing process, these non-spherical fillers will actually orient in a direction more than another direction, and because of that, you do get some directionality uh, and that's another thing that causes this non-uniform electric susceptibility. And then finally, material polarization. This is on a molecular sense, a molecular level, uh, that you can have polarization that is oriented more on one axis versus another, and that can be for a bunch of different reasons, actually. <clears throat> so um, anisotropy, if you want to look at it more in a mathematical or physical sense, uh, anisotropy, anisotropy is really related to a tensor and, again, related to the original formula we talked about, which is the uh, electric flux and complex permittivity and electric fields. But as a practical point, normally what we do is we ignore the non-diagonal elements of the 3x3 three three array that's making up this tensor. And um, that is usually well enough because those, uh, those uh, non-diagonal elements are usually a very minor effect on really what's going on here. And then also along the lines of uh, a practical note is that the X and Y axis for most materials for dielectric constant are not that much different. The Z axis is usually, well, I shouldn't say usually, but many times it is uh, very different. So a lot of times what we will do, uh, we will measure the XY plane and not specifically the X axis or Y axis, and then we will measure the Z axis. And some of that is because uh, test methods, the test methods we use, it's actually pretty difficult to measure and isolate the x-axis separate from the y-axis. can be done. It's just not easy. And the more accurate way and easier way for us and most people that measure materials is to measure the xy plane and then also measure the z-axis or the thickness uh, for dielectric constant. And also when you look at electromagnetic modeling software that's used to uh, model uh, RF designs, they typically do the same thing. So when you do have a software that accounts for anisotropy, they also look at, uh, they usually ask for the z-axis uh, epsilon sub r or the dielectric constant for the z-axis. And if you want to account for anisotropy, they typically ask for the xy plane dielectric constant and not specifically the x and the y. Um, so for anisotropy, uh, and doing modeling anyway, normally anisotropy is not considered in a lot of uh, like transmission line stubs, things like that, but where anisotropy is normally considered is edge coupled features. So if you have a design that's um, like a directional coupler or maybe a microstrip edge coupled bandpass filter, a lot of times the designer will uh, account for the anisotropy because now you have even and odd modes, and uh, these modes are affected by the XY plane and the Z axis. So as a general rule uh, for anisotropy, and these are very general, uh, materials with woven glass reinforcement usually have more anisotropy as opposed to materials that do not have woven glass. There are exceptions. Uh, and then also, uh, again, another general rule, if the dielectric constant is higher, you usually have more aniso anisotropy. Uh, there is an exception or two there. Actually, Rogers has a material that's RO4360 G2 laminate that has a dielectric constant about... 6.15, and the XY plane is about the same. It's actually very isotropic. But you can see in the table below, the 3006, it's a different formulation, and it does have a different dielectric constant in the Z-axis compared to the XY plane. The XY plane here we measured using SPDR, which is split post dielectric resonator, and uh, this test method actually measures the XY plane of the material only for dielectric constant and dissipation factor. But the thing to, to think about on this chart here is if you look at the lower dielectric constant material, the RO3003 laminate and the RO3203 laminates, 
both of them are pretty isotropic, so the dielectric constant is not too much different between the z-axis and the x-y plane. When you get into the higher dielectric constant materials, such as the RL3006 or the RL3010 laminates, that's where you can see more anisotropy. And that's generally a pretty good common statement. Even though we do have some materials like TMM10I or TMM13I, they're uh, formulated to be isotropic, and the I part of the name there means that. So we do have materials that are isotropic or formulated to be that way. So this is kind of a good general rule to think about. Um, so let's talk about copper surface roughness. This is a pretty big deal. Uh, it's one of those topics that uh, when you first get into it, you don't think there's much to it. And then when you get into it a lot, you find out this really causes a lot of uh, grief for designers unless they really understand all the intricacies. So I'm going to first start talking about something that I showed before. And any of you that may have seen the webinar too for me, then you're probably getting bored on this slide. But it is pretty descriptive of um, how the thickness of the substrate for the circuit actually does um, uh, make a difference for the conductor losses or dielectric losses to dominate. So really, uh, the insertion loss itself is made up of several different losses. So the total loss of a circuit or the insertion loss is really made up of about four different losses, and that is dielectric loss, conductor loss, radiation loss, and leakage loss. And today I'm, today I'm not going to talk about dielectric, I'm sorry, radiation loss or leakage loss, but we will talk about dielectric loss and conductor loss that make up the total insertion loss. And uh, what I've done here was uh, tested three different sets of circuits. They're all using the same material. It's RO4350B laminate. And the center chart, let's start, start with that one. The center chart has a legend. And really what I did is I measured these circuits using the microstrip differential length method, and that's the thick uh, purple line I suppose that color is. And then what I did was use a model that is uh, its actually a free software available on our Rogers Technology Support Hub website. It's MWI 2014, and we're soon to upgrade that to MWI 2016. But it uses the Hammerstead and Jensen uh, models and also the Morgan rule to understand uh, microstrip losses. And the reason I like this model is because it's very simple and very fast and also compares relatively well to the performance I'm getting on the circuit and it tells me how much of the total loss are split up between dielectric losses and conductor losses. So you can see in the middle chart there, the green curve is my modeled total loss, insertion loss, and that matches the measured insertion loss pretty well. And then what's nice, I can see how much the, the, uh, that total loss is made up of dielectric loss and conductor loss. So the red curve is the conductor loss, <coughs> and the blue, blue curve is the dielectric losses. And for the circuits using 10 mil 4350D laminate, you can see that the conductor losses dominate. There's more conductor losses than dielectric losses. And now if we go to the left chart, using the exact same materials but now thinner, this is now 6.6 .6 mil 4350D, <coughs> you can see that the red curve, the conductor losses, really dominate. So the major player on the thinner circuit is conductor losses when it comes to the impact on insertion loss. So the conductor is a big deal when you have a thinner circuit. And then to the far right the other extreme, and that's a thicker circuit. That's using a 30 mil thick RO4250B laminate. And here the red curve, the conductor losses, is actually a minimal concern. And it's actually dielectric losses that really dominate. So the uh, whole thought process here is really thinner circuits are more susceptible to conductor effects. In this case, it's related to losses, insertion loss, but it can be related to other things such as phase response. So I keep pressing the wrong button. Okay, go. Uh, so this is just an, a quick example of some measurements I've taken to prove the point. And this is using an RO2003 laminate. And what I did was uh, make some circuits, again, microstrip transmission lines, and some circuits were using 20 mil thick laminate and some were using 5 mil thick laminate. And also I had different copper types on there. I had ED copper and rolled copper. The ED copper had a copper surface roughness of about 1.8 microns RMS. The rolled copper is about 0 0.3 microns RMS. So the lowest loss curve is the 20 mil RO2003 laminate with a half ounce rolled copper. That's the purple curve at the top. And then the next curve is also 20 mil 2003 laminate with ED copper. So you can see the impact of ED copper does, in fact, cause more insertion loss. And at 25 gigahertz, it makes a difference about 0.1 dB per inch. But now if you look at the 5 mil thick substrate, uh, the circuits using the 5 mil thick substrate, you can see there's a much bigger difference. And the 5 mil RO3003 with rolled copper is the red curve 
five mil three thousand three laminate with the EB copper is the blue curve, and there at twenty five gigahertz is a difference of about point three five dB per inch. So it's pretty obvious that a thinner circuit is much more dominated by the conductor effects than a thicker circuit. Uh, so, something else, though, is uh, besides losses, these uh, copper surface roughness and the conductor effects can impact more than just losses. It can impact uh, phase velocity, propagation velocity, propagation delay. And uh, here what I did was uh, an example of some circuits I tested, and in this case it's using 4 mil RO4350B laminate. And these are two circuits. They're exactly the same for length, same substrate, same everything, except for the copper uh, that I used. I clad it with two different coppers. One is a rolled copper, which is not a standard offering on this material, but I just did it for an experiment to get the smoothest copper I could on here. And then the other copper is the standard copper that is used on this laminate. It has a copper roughness of about 2.8 microns RMS. And what's interesting is, well, let me describe the curve here real quick. Uh, on the far left, um, you can see there's a little bit of a glitch there, and that's really where the connector meets the circuit. So you get a little bit of uh, reflection at the signal launch, of course. And then as you go across to the right in time, uh, to the right there, you see it dive off to the very bottom down to zero, and that's because I put a short on the end of the circuit. There's also a little glitch before that dive down to the zero, and that little glitch there is the other connector. So it's a very simple microstrip transmission line with connectors on two ends, and the end on the right side is basically grounded, and that's why you get that abrupt short uh, going down to zero. And um, anyway, I like to do that with impedance curves mainly because I get a little bit cleaner reflection. And I can see the impedance a little bit more accurately. But the uh, the bottom line for this uh, curve is that using the exact same material and the same physical link circuits, the only difference being copper, the copper that has the rougher surface actually has more of a propagation delay. By about 164 picoseconds, it's slower that much. So the copper surface roughness does in fact uh, impact the phase velocity and the propagation. So, um, continuing on that same thought process and uh, kind of doing a simple uh, way to look at this, uh, what I'm going to talk about now is really the propagation delay and also the um, how how the, the dielectric constant actually impacts that. So, a very simple example here is if you have a, a electromagnetic uh, waves zipping around free space, going to the speed of light. Once it encounters another medium that has a higher dielectric constant, several things happen, and one of them is that it slows down. So, and so for the next few slides, I'm going to talk about that some, where a slower wave means higher dielectric constant, or higher dielectric constant means a slower wave, however you want to put that. And uh, there's other things that can slow the wave down besides the dielectric constant of the substrate, and that is copper surface roughness. So we know that the copper surface roughness can slow the wave propagation, and in the sense of how the circuit perceives it, the circuit will perceive that as a higher dielectric constant, even though it could have the exact same substrate, it's just the copper slowed down the wave, so now the circuit perceives a higher dielectric constant. So I'm not going to get in details of this excerpt that I'm shown here, but I wanted to give you the reference for it. So if you want more details uh, with more engineering rigor, then you can uh, look up this paper or go to our website and get it, and it will give you a lot more information and details on that. Uh, from that same paper, though, this chart is pretty descriptive, and I'd like to use it to really describe the, the effects quite well. And what we did was um, we used 4 mil thick LCP laminate, which is the Rogers Ultra M 3850 laminate, and uh, we clad that substrate with different copper. And we used the exact same 4 mil LCP laminate, same substrate, same lot of substrate, side-by-side -side sheets of the same stuff. I mean, it was we minimized the material properties as much as we could. And then what we did is we clad it with different types of copper with distinctly different roughnesses. We uh, made these laminates, sent them off to the circuit fabricator. They made microstrip transmission lines for us, came back, we tested them. And we were uh, looking at effective dielectric constant versus frequency, which I'll show the test method a little bit later how we did this. But what we get is from about 8 gigahertz to 50 gigahertz, we get the dielectric constant versus frequency. Well, excuse me, this is actually effective dielectric constant versus frequency. And uh, you can see that the circuits that use the smoother copper, the red curve, 0 0.5 microns RMS, has the lowest effective dielectric constant. Then the circuits that had a little bit rougher copper, the green curve, 0 0.7. You can see the effective dielectric constant goes up a little more, et cetera. So you can actually see the trends here. 
And the blue curve is actually the curve where the circuits are using the roughest copper. And again, the rougher copper is uh, actually slowing the wave propagation down. And as I said before, a slower wave, the circuit will perceive that as a higher dielectric constant, even though, keep in mind, this is the same material. The substrate is not changed. It does have the same dielectric constant. But because the copper roughness is slowing the wave down, that's actually why this gets a higher effective dielectric constant. And it's not trivial. In this case, uh, between these different circuits using the same substrate, there's about a 0.3 difference in effective dielectric constant. So it's not the material that's actually changing. It's the copper surface roughness that's making it do that. Now, there's a thickness dependency, and that is, uh, as I explained before in losses, that the thinner circuits are more dominated by conductor effects. And that's true with loss, and it's also true with phase response and propagation phase velocity. So the thicker circuits are less impacted by the copper surface roughness, and the thinner circuits are more impacted by it. And we usually call this uh, circuit perceived dielectric constant uh, design decay. So that's the term that we've adopted some time ago, and it's really just saying it's the dielectric constant that should be used in design and modeling. <clears throat> and um, so I did another experiment here where I used the same materials as much as I could. And in fact, I used the exact same materials out of the same bag. So I had the same copper, same uh, substrate, same everything. And the only difference was I made a 4 mil laminate and I made a 30 mil laminate. Sent that off to the fabricator. They made microscope transmission lines. I tested it for design decay. And what I got on the thinner laminate, 3.95 for design decay. The thicker laminate, 3.68. What's interesting there is I know for a fact these are the exact same materials, same copper, same everything. The only difference is thickness. <clears throat> and the thinner circuit is more dominated by the conductor effects, the roughness, than the thicker circuit. And because of that, the thinner circuit has a slower wave uh, propagation, uh, and that actually causes the dielectric constant of the circuit to be reported higher, even though the substrate is the same. Now, if you even go thicker, instead of 30 mil, get a 60 mil, you'll get a dielectric constant of about 3.66. If you go to 90 mils, 3.66. 120 mils, 3.66. And you get the idea. Once the, once the copper is far enough apart, or thick substrate, then the copper roughness really doesn't impact the uh, phase velocity, and it doesn't impact the perceived circuit-perceived dielectric constant or the design decay. So on our data sheet for the RL4350B, we give it a design decay of 3.66, because we can't really put on the data sheet multiple numbers of all these different thicknesses. So what we did is put on there the design decay of 3.66, which is really the intrinsic dielectric constant of the material when the copper effects are not dominant. Now, just to drive that home a little bit more, I did some more testing on RO3003 laminates at different thicknesses. The 5 mil thick uh, circuits using the 5 mil thick substrate is a green curve. That's the higher dielectric constant. The blue curve is 10 mil thick. The red curve is 20 mil thick circuits. And if you go thicker and thicker, you finally approach the intrinsic dielectric constant value of this material, which is 3.0. So if you test this with a 60 mil or 50 mil uh, circuit, you're going to end up having trends right around 3.0 for dielectric constant. Uh, another thing to think about is, as I said, thin circuits are dominated by conductor effects. In this case, what I'm doing is looking at 5 mil RO3003 circuits made on that. And I'm also doing this very wide band. So I'm starting at about 100 megahertz, 0.1 gigahertz, going all the way up to 110 gigahertz. But really what I'm trying to show here is the same substrate, the same thickness, being very thin, using ED copper with a roughness of about 1.8 microns RMS. Compared to a rolled copper, it's about 0 0.3 microns RMS, very smooth. You see that the rolled copper is actually not affecting the wave propagation much, and it is really reporting a dielectric constant very close to what the intrinsic value of the material is, which is 3.0. So even though it's smooth and the circuit is sensitive to, I'm sorry, even though the circuit is thin and the circuit is sensitive to the conductor effects, in the case of a very smooth conductor using rolled copper, it doesn't impact the uh, phase velocity much or the design decay. The same circuit with the rougher copper most certainly does. Uh, let's see. So let me give you some examples of design decay and some things to think about. First off, design decay is really not a materials property. It's a circuit property. And what I mean by that is when we do QA testing here, we're actually testing the raw substrate itself in a clamped fixture that actually turns out to be a clamped strip line resonator. And what we do is we etch off all the copper, clamp it together in the fixture, and test it. And we're testing raw material properties at that point. 
but in that clamping fixture, there's some properties due to that fixture and test method that are not circuit related, so it's not a true circuit test. It's a raw material test. Now, whenever we do this test for design decay, we are testing real circuits. We're testing microstrip transmission lines. So design decay is really a circuit property, and that design decay and the values that we have, that should be used for high-frequency circuit design and high-frequency modeling. And the design decay is based on or dependent on uh, intrinsic dielectric constant of the substrate, thickness of the substrate, copper surface roughness, and frequency. And these all blend together to make things rather complicated, unfortunately. Uh, but as a general statement, the circuits with higher losses have more dispersion, or basically the design decay will change more with the change in frequency for higher loss circuits. And um, once you do have a design decay curve um, defined by measuring circuits, you can actually extrapolate that design decay curve in a linear fashion out to frequencies that you didn't test. And I'll give an example of that real quick, too. And then the design decay tolerance, that's a tricky situation, and I'll talk about that in just a few more slides. So this was a quick slide on uh, dispersion, and what I'm really showing is a comparison of two different materials in microstrip transmission lines. Uh, they were both 20 mil thick, and the blue curve is a high-performance FR4, which really isn't intended to be tested at these higher frequencies, but it did it anyway just to prove the point that a lossier material does have more slope, uh, or basically it has more dispersion. The dielectric constant changes with frequency more than a low-loss material, like the RO3035 materials that I'm showing here. And uh, so you can see that the RO3035 material does have a slight negative slope, but at this scale it's really hard to see. But it does have a slight negative slope as you go out in frequency. And the more lossy material has obviously much more slope. Now, recall again uh, this chart that I showed before about these dipolar re relaxation moments. And in the range of frequencies that we generally test in, we're actually testing in the range that is pretty linear. So what you can do is once you've measured circuits and you defined the um, dielectric constant versus frequency slope, um, you can actually take that data and extrapolate it out to frequencies that you didn't test. And generally speaking, the predicted DK values are probably good out to about 300 gigahertz or so. And let me give you a quick example of that. So here what I did was tested 6.6 uh, .6 R4250B laminate up to about 20 gigahertz. And I have a uh, measured, defined slope that I've uh, drawn there in orange. And uh, then after that, I have an extrapolated line that I drew beyond that from 20 gigahertz out to uh, 100 gigahertz. And the measured DK at 20 gigahertz is 3.86. And my estimated DK at 100 gigahertz is 3.82. And then I went and went and measured the circuit all the way out to 100, actually 110 gigahertz. And you can see that the extrapolated or the predicted value of uh, 3.82 is actually pretty valid once you get out that far and you actually measure it. So the, the nice thing about this is once you've got the slope defined for uh, any circuit, even if it's up to 20 or 30 gigahertz, you can actually take that slope and extrapolate it out to much higher frequencies. So the dielectric uh, constant, I'm sorry, the design DK tolerance. I've been asked by many customers before about the tolerance, and there's no easy answer to that. So I'm going to explain some of the reasoning behind it and then some of the thought process. But uh, when in doubt, I would say get on the phone and talk to uh, someone here at Rogers, and we'll be able to help you with it. But the bottom line is why the tolerance for design DK is so difficult <clears throat> is because um, it's fitness dependent, of course, as I already showed. And what happens is many times uh, a, a, a laminate made of the same material will have a different thickness tolerance. So a 10 mil thick laminate would have a tolerance, as example, plus or minus 1 mil, and a 20 mil thick laminate might have a tolerance of plus or minus 2 mils. So for 20 mil thick laminate, you could get a thickness of the circuit uh, anywhere from 18 mils up to 22, and the 10 mil laminate could be a thickness from 9 to 11. And that thickness variation from lot to lot, circuit to circuit, is a that can be another variable for the design decay that's difficult to to get your arms around. And then there's copper surface roughness. Uh, we uh, here at Rogers, uh, our Rogers materials anyway, we typically have the same copper on the same substrate. And what I mean by that is, if we make a 10 mil 4350B, it is the same ED copper always. We don't have two different ED copper vendors. A lot of laminate suppliers do that. They want to have multiple sources. The problem is, uh, even though they're the same type of ED copper, they can have different uh, copper surface roughness, 
uh, and there can be some other tricks about the treatment of the copper as well. So um, the copper surface roughness can vary from one copper to another copper if the vendor that's making the laminate is actually not using the same copper. And then the copper surface roughness itself has a variation that's a normal variation, and that is the roughness number that I've been reporting so far on these slides is really an average number. So when I say there's an average of 2.8 microns RMS roughness for the RO4350B laminate, that copper, that is true, but it does have normal lots of lot variation and even normal within lot variation and even normal within sheet variation. So the copper roughness can vary uh, on that copper within a sheet. And that is also another reason you can have more of a tolerance on design decay. And then, of course, the intrinsic dielectric constant value of the material itself has a tolerance associated with it. And then the microstrip differential phase length method that we use to determine the design decay, that has some kind of accuracy um, tolerance associated with it. But the long story made short is there's no easy way to do this except for us just to measure a whole bunch of circuits from many different lots. And uh, typically what I try to do is get the same material, same thickness, same copper, same everything, and just have many different lots of it and take a lot of measurements. And when I do that, here's an example of the 10 4350B laminate made from 14 different lots over a pretty long period of time. And uh, really what we get is a total range of about 0.115 for a dielectric constant. And that's assuming that a lot of the tolerance is off the side here. And you can also see that the copper surface roughness for this particular copper varies anywhere from about 2 to 3 microns. Uh, so there's a fair amount of variance there. Uh, but again, the range for this uh, type of laminate is about 0.115. If this was 20 mil thick laminate, being the 20 mil thick is thicker and less uh, sensitive to the copper effects, that range by itself is actually going to drop. And then another thing you can do is a study I did here using the same substrate pretty much, which is 10.7 mil 4350B low pro using a low profile copper, smoother copper. And now you see the copper is much smoother, also is less range. And what happens with that when you test many lots of that is you have a tighter range of the design decay. So bottom line is um, smoother copper means less design decay range, less design decay tolerance from circuit to circuit, batch to batch. So the test method, I'll step through real quickly here, and it's a really simple test method. It's the microstrip differential phase length method, and what I do on one sheet of material I will make two different transmission line circuits, and they will be 50 ohm transmission line circuits, and the signal launch will be exactly the same on, on the circuits. I typically use in launch connectors, and um, the only difference is really going to be physical length. And I usually have a 3 to 1 ratio, sometimes I do 4 to 1. I've done some, some experiments, so that's kind of a long story that I won't get into now. Um, but what we do is we measure the phase measurements on the short and the long circuit at a particular frequency, and then we move on to another frequency do the same thing. And then we use the microstrip phase response formula, and we manipulate this formula to account for having two circuits of different lengths. So to the far right formula, what I'm showing here is delta L, which is a difference in length between the short and the long circuit. And then the variable above there, delta phi, that's actually the difference in uh, phase angle between the short and the long circuit. And that's when measured at frequency f, and then c is the speed of light. So that gives us the measured effective dielectric constant of the circuit. And then what I do is I use MWI 2016, that's the free software that you can download from our technology support hub, or you can use a field solver. And into the software, you would put the exact dimensions of the conductor width, the conductor thickness, the substrate thickness, everything that's the geometry of the circuit. And then you have the model generate the modeled effective dielectric constant given a dielectric constant you put in. And then what you do is you keep adjusting the dielectric constant that you enter until the effective dielectric constant of the model matches the effective dielectric constant of the measured circuits. And then the dielectric constant that does that is assumed to be the dielectric constant of the substrate. And then we increment the next frequency, and we do it all over again. And what we end up with is a dielectric constant versus frequency curve that looks like this. So this is circuits that were made on 5 mil uh, CLTE XT laminate. And uh, this is an extremely wide band, as wide as I can do anyway, uh, response for dielectric constant versus frequency. And this is going from about 33 megahertz out to 110 gigahertz. And it's actually pretty well behaved, and you can see it does have some slope, but it's actually pretty minor slope at this scale if you look at the dielectric constant numbers. 
So the uh, divide decay numbers can be used for other structures other than microstrip. Even though we're defining these values with microstrip transmission lines, you can use it for a ground and waveguide, and I have done that and get pretty good results. There is a little bit of an exception there, though. So the design decay numbers that are generated using microstrip differential phase lengths, uh, they generally work pretty good for uh, ground and coplanar waveguides that are moderately or loosely coupled. However, the tightly coupled ground and coplanar waveguides, uh, they normally, uh, the design decay needs to be lowered a little bit because the copper roughness effect is actually a little bit uh, smaller. And what I mean by that, in the cross-sectional view of the ground and coplanar waveguide as shown here, um, I'm showing really what the electric fields look like, uh, kind of sort of anyway, best I could draw it. But when it's tightly coupled on the coplanar top uh, layer, the space between the adjacent ground and the signal conductor in the middle, and that space is very thought and very tight, uh, then you have more current density along the sidewalls and really the current density at the copper uh, surface that the, uh, the roughness is most important at, which is the substrate copper interface the uh, energy there is much less, so the copper surface roughness is impacting a tightly coupled ground and coplanar waveguide less than it would if it was moderately or loosely coupled. So you can use design decay with ground and coplanar waveguide, and you probably want to lower it a little bit uh, for tightly coupled, and you, of course you can always call us and we can give you some input on that. But loosely coupled or moderately coupled, um, it usually works pretty good. Now, strip line, uh, you can also use the design decay for that. Um, it gets a little more complicated because strip line has a few more variables. And one thing that gets a little messy is as you make a strip line, which is a three copper layer circuit, you need to bond layers together. And the bonding material, which is a pre normally, that many times will have a different intrinsic dielectric constant than the laminate itself. And that combination of dielectric constant by itself makes things a little interesting. And there's also another kicker, and that is um, there are four copper substrate interfaces in a strip line circuit, and these different interfaces will have many times different copper surface roughnesses, and I'll explain that here on the slide or so. And uh, then the other issue is how we define the design DK for pre -preg. And that's a little complicated because our pre are used in a variety of different ways. And in one sense, our pre -pregs are used to bond together two blank laminates or blank cores. And what I mean by that is one side of the copper is etched off these two cores, and when you laminate together, the pre -preg is in contact with the other laminates but not in touch with any copper, so there is no copper influence when the pre -preg is used that way. And in that case, you need to use the intrinsic value dielectric constant of the material. In the case of a pre -preg, uh, in some cases, the prepreg is used to where there's only copper on one side of uh, the prepreg, and now you do not have the same scenario that we measured the design DK where you have copper on two sides, as a microstrip transmission line is. So again, you have to adjust the design DK for that, and of course you can get a hold of us and we'll help with that. So there's two constructions most commonly used to build a strip line, and one of them is called coarse construction, one is called a full lamp construction. Top picture is coil uh, core construction, and that's basically when two laminates are used to build this three copper layer circuit, and the top laminate has all the copper etched off, and then it's bonded to the bottom laminate. So in this case, uh, we at Rogers, if we made that laminate, we can tell you what that copper surface roughness is on three of those copper substrate interfaces, but the interface at the bonding material to the uh, signal, that we don't know very well. We know what that copper surface roughness is when it leaves here, but when the circuit fabricator uses it, what they normally do is apply an alternative oxide and they roughen that surface some for better bonding. So we don't know what that number is. And then in the case of a foil lamination, uh, that's where a circuit fabricator will use our laminates, and we do know what the copper surface roughness is on that laminate, but then they will use prepreg and they will use their own, own copper foil to bond the top copper layer. In that case, we don't know what that roughness is. So there could be two interfaces there that we don't know what the copper roughness is. So strip line gets a little more tricky when you uh, get into trying to find the design decay. Now, the last couple of slides is just really where to find this design decay information. And I'm cutting a little short on time, so I'm going to buzz through this a little quicker. Uh, but really, for the high volume materials, such as the RO4000 materials, we have a document called a design reference that gives a lot of design decay information on many different thicknesses of the material. And we're trying to make more of these design references for other materials as well. But in cases where we have less information for design DK, uh, we can still make a very good educated guess knowing the properties of the materials and having the experience that we have. 
So if you do run into an issue where you want very detailed design dielectric constant information and we don't have the more details, then please give us a call and we should be able to help you there. So the next few slides are really just uh, examples of this uh, design uh, reference for the RO4350B. And in parentheses, I have RO4835, uh, which has the exact same electrical performance. It's just RO4835 has been formulated to be very good for uh, high power applications and uh, good for long-term thermal aging. Even though the 4350 is very good for this, uh, the 4835 is one step beyond that even. So uh, this slide is just showing you frequency dependencies of the different thicknesses of the 4350B and the 4350B low-pro laminates. So I have different thicknesses here in the different columns. I have different frequencies. And you would use this if you were designing something at a specific frequency, like 3 gigahertz. If you're using a 3 gigahertz uh, directional coupler and you were using 20 mil thick uh, 4350B, in that case, you would use about a 3.74 dielectric constant. So this would be used for frequency uh, dependent designs. The next slide is actually showing uh, what you would use for di design dielectric constant for non-frequency dependent. And the most common use there is really characteristic impedance where we have a circuit fabricator that is um, wanting to make a circuit that's 50 ohm controlled impedance and they just want to know what the characteristic impedance is so they want to know if the design VK would be best for that and that's the values that you would use here. And then uh, finally I have a lot of curves in these documents that shows in this case, 10, point, 10 mil 4350B and 10.7 mil 4350B low pro and shows the dielectric constant versus frequency curves. So that's a uh, document for the 4350B that we're wanting to do with all of our materials ultimately. There's also an easier way of doing this, and you can download a free software from our Technology Support Hub website, and that's the MWI 2014, soon to be upgraded to MWI 2016, and it has the design DK built into it. So a quick example here is, if you're doing frequency-dependent type of design, maybe it's a 3 gigahertz um, edge couple bandpass filter. You select the material you want, you select the thickness, and it will automatically tell you what the design decay is for the frequency dependency, assuming you have this clicked where it says use RF design decay value. And uh, another quick example would be showing the same thing, but this would be looking for characteristic impedance and or a wideband or a digital application, and here you click use the design decay value, you select the material you want, the thickness you want, and then it gives you the design dielectric constant. And I bumped through that pretty quick. I know, I apologize, but I realized I was getting a little short on time. I, I sped up. So uh, again, I do have a few minutes for questions, so uh, please let me know what you think. Excellent. John, thank you very much. That was a really informative presentation. We do have quite a few questions, so um, let's get started right away. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first one that I'd like to give you came in early in the webinar, and uh, let me find that one again. What, what is the best way to measure DK is all it says? Wow, that's a tough one. <laughs> is it a broad uh, question so, or what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a tough one because I've got a book on um, how to measure, uh, how to characterize microwave materials. And in that book, I think I have 81 different test methods. So, mm -hmm. boy, that's a tough one. You know, the bottom line is what I'd like to say is whatever your application is, try to define a test method that is most similar to your application. So um, I personally like the microstrip difference of phase length for very wide band. But if you really want to do something accurate and your application is narrow band, Ring resonators are actually pretty good, and resonators in general, I think, are a little more accurate than the transmission lines that are used in transmission or reflection techniques. But resonators, I think, are a little more accurate. Um, but again, I think the best thing is really whatever your application is, is to use the test method that's most like your application. Excellent. All right, and, and John, excuse me if I ask a question that might appear to be redundant or that you answered. I'm a newbie at this. Um, so the next question that came in was, is there DK and loss tangent data at millimeter waves? And he goes on to say 60 gigahertz and 77 gigahertz. Yes. Uh, I have a new toy as of early this year that's capable of 110 gigahertz, and I like to play with that toy a lot. And because of that, I do have a uh, dielectric constant out to 110 gigahertz using the microstrip differential phase length method. And then for dissipation factor, that gets a little messy, uh, but I have done things with ring resonators at 60 gigahertz and 77 gigahertz, and uh, it's kind of a long story I won't get into now, but yes, we definitely have the information. Okay. And how can I describe the needed roughness? It says, is RA, comma, RZ the right way? 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Good question. You know what? Most of the uh, electromagnetic modeling software, and there's a bunch of good ones out there, uh, Sonnet, HFSS, CST, ADS, I could go on and on. There's a bunch of them. And most of them, they look at copper surface roughness in terms of RMS, root mean square, which in the terms of how copper vendors measure it, their value would be R sub Q. So the R sub A, R sub Z, R sub T, those are different values that copper vendors measure. Um, but the R sub Q is actually the, the, the measurement that we want to look at for um, microwave and millimeter wave type of modeling. Okay. And uh, what is the difference between ED and rolled copper? Uh, it's really how the materials are made. How This is raw copper foil. It's how the copper foil is made. The rolled copper starts off with a very big chunk or ingot of copper and it goes through a series of rolling processes to roll it down to the thickness that you want. And because of that, you get a very smooth surface. And then the ED copper is electro-deposited copper, and that's actually a plating process where you plate up copper. And in the plating process, uh, just by the nature of it, you usually get a rougher surface. Uh, but it's two different coppers. Uh, we have a fair amount of information on that. We actually got a lot of information on that. If somebody wants to get all of us, we'll be happy to give them a lot of details. Okay, excellent. All right, so the next one says, I would like to know which effect dominates effective decay and so phase velocity. And he gives choices. One, normal decrease of dielectric constant over frequency due to the inner guiding material properties. Or two, surface roughness, RMS, of surrounding copper in a microstrip. Hmm. Can I say yes to both? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, uh, unfortunately, I hate to say this to engineers, but it's really true. Sometimes the answer is it depends. And my point was uh, earlier that a thinner circuit is going to be more dominated by the copper surface roughness than a thicker circuit. So uh, on a thicker circuit, 30 mils or thicker, the copper roughness really isn't that big an impact, and it's really the dielectric constant of the substrate itself that's causing the variation, if there is some. But on a thinner circuit, 5 mils or something like that, it's really the copper surface roughness that has the most variation for design decay. And I, I think I answered that. Okay. And this one just came in. I'm not sure if it's spraying off of one of those questions, but it simply says how to estimate decay in multilayer structures. Wow, that's another good one. Uh, these people are listening too closely, apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, that's a tough one, really, because, uh, and the thought, whoever asked the question, it's a really good thought because now you've got different copper interfaces, and in some cases you're bonding to a smooth side of the copper. In other cases, you're using the rougher side from the laminate, and that gets to be a real mess. And we have worked directly with customers on that. And to be honest with you, the best thing to do is really to call us up, get a hold of our application development managers, and a lot of our sales engineers are extremely technical as well. So that's just to talk to us about that because. That's really a case-by-case -case type of issue, and it's a really good question that I, I can't answer, unfortunately. It's really case-by-case. -case. Okay. Okay. Well, you'll get all the uh, contact information after this webinar. can probably uh, reach out to them directly. All right. Good. Um, there's more questions. You have time to stay with me. We've got a couple more minutes. Sure. I've got a couple more minutes. Go ahead. Good. 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 Okay. So here's one. Which Rogers substrates are suitable for millimeter wave frequency applications? Well, we got a bunch of them actually running at uh, 60 gigahertz backhaul, 77 gigahertz for automotive uh, sensor type things. We've got some even at 90, so it really depends on a lot of stuff. But the most common one right now, I'd have to say a millimeter wave, is probably our RO3003 laminate. Uh, that's used a lot at the uh, millimeter wave range. Uh, actually, a very common material that's used across the board at all kinds of frequencies is RO4350B and RO4350B low pro. And they can be designed, if you design everything right, they can be used at 60 gigahertz and even higher. Um, and it's normally, the, the big trick, obviously, is when you get to higher frequencies, you normally need a thinner laminate because you got uh, mode suppression and you got radiation effects, you got a bunch of stuff to deal with. So normally it's a thin laminate, and uh, the lower loss thin laminates that are very consistent for dielectric constant is, is really what you look for. But we have several different materials, the 3003, the 4350B laminates, the 5880, 6002, droids. So there's a bunch of them. Again, that's probably something good to talk to us about. Okay, good. Um, you know, we do have so many more questions coming in, and they're still coming. Um, but we are out of time. You're gonna, I'm going to have to get all these questions over to you, John, after the webinar, and, and you're going to have your work cut out for you. 
No problem. Give me something during during Christmas. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> we have run out of time, time, but we at Microwave Journal want to thank you, John, for this presentation. Also, Rogers Corporation. We'd like to encourage our audience to go ahead and visit your website. That's um, RogersCorp.com. Uh, this webinar has been recorded, and it's going to be available to view in the event section of the Microwave Journal website. Look for that uh, tomorrow afternoon or Thursday morning. Everyone who registered will receive an email shortly with a link to download a copy of today's slides. And um, just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you very much.